you guys so I am going to be going through the book of Philippians next and why am I doing this well because the city of Philippi is mentioned in Acts 16 and so I went through first and second Timothy because Timotheus is introduced in uh, in Acts 16 uh, I'm going through the book of Acts and uh, Galatia was mentioned in Acts 16 as is Philippi so we went through uh, first and second Timothy and Galatians and now we're going through Philippians and also uh, the city of Thyatira is mentioned so I'll take some information from that to continue writing the letter to the church of Thyatira from the book of Revelation chapter 2 but we're coming to the city of Philippi and I was gonna skip this one because I actually have never gone through the book of Philippians before I've, I've uh, taken verses from it when I've been writing uh, and you know teaching other stuff but I've never actually gone through the book of Philippians and for some reason this just seems like I have a mental block when it comes to this book so I'm gonna have to fight through that to, to get through this and I don't know why that is like I do not understand this at all but as I was going through I was I was gonna skip this and and get to first uh, and second Thessalonians which when we get to Acts 17 will be introduced but the city of Philippi is brought up in 1 Thessalonians 1, and so I was like, all right, now I need to go through Philippians. So here we are. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. And again, this is tangent to Acts 16. I'm going through the, the book of Acts, and so the city is mentioned in Acts 16, and so that's why we're coming here, is I thought it would be a good idea to go through each of the epistles when they have corresponding cities as those cities are mentioned in the book of Acts. So uh, I'll get through the, the book of Acts more slowly, but we'll cover more ground as we go. So welcome to the book of Philippians. And here is what my Bible has to say about this epistle. Paul writes a thank you note to the believers at Philippi for their help in his hour of need. And he uses the occasion to send along some instruction on Christian unity. His central thought is simple. Only in Christ are real unity and joy possible. With Christ as your model of humility and service, you can enjoy a oneness of purpose, attitude, goal, and labor, a truth which Paul illustrates from his own life and one the, Philippian, uh, the Philippians desperately needed to hear. Within their own ranks, fellow workers in the Philippian church are at odds, hindering the work and proclaiming new life in Christ. Because of this, Paul exhorts the church to stand fast, be of the same mind, rejoice in the Lord always, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, which it talks about in chapter 4. So this is a four-chapter book. It's very small. And here we go. Chapter 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. And... Again, this goes back to Acts 16. Acts 16, 1. Then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. So Paul comes to Derby and Lystra, and he picks up T Timothy on his missionary journey, which is why in Philippians, uh, he's got Paul and Timotheus. He's got Timotheus with him. Um, so just kind of recapping a little bit from Acts 16. Um, Galatia is mentioned in verse 6. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, and after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And then passing by Mysia, they came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. So... Philippi is in Macedonia, and that is where we are now. So, as I mentioned, uh, it's an offshoot of Acts 16, which is why Timotheus is with Paul, because Paul picked Timothy up in Acts 16 uh, on his missionary team. So, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints of in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with 
the bishops and deacons. And it's interesting because bishops and deacons are um, who they should be, how they should be selected, what kind of character, what they should do in the church. Those kind of things are contained in 1 Timothy. Because Timothy is a young pastor setting up a church, and so Paul is writing to Timothy to tell him how that should be done. So it's interesting that they're writing to uh, bishops and deacons because who and who those people should be and how they should be selected is actually discussed in 1 Timothy, uh, the letter that Paul writes to Timotheus, who is on his missionary journey right now. So um, Timothy is getting a very fine education from Paul about what to do and how to go about uh, doing this, uh, this gospel preaching and how to be and all of that stuff. So it's just kind of interesting how all of these are linked. Continuing on in verse 2, it says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it even until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart in as much as both in my bond and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of my grace. So this is interesting because really this is going to be a, a letter of edification. Is They need help to unify and to uh, encourage and to promote, to be cheerful, to be thankful. It's not that they lack faith. It's just that they need, they need some support. They need moral support. And that's really what this is going to be about, is giving these people moral support. It's interesting because um, some of the verses here actually relate to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12. And this was uh, when I was doing my own research about 1 Corinthians 3 and the Bema and what constitutes a good work. You know, works that stand through the fire will be for reward and, and what will be for loss, what does not constitute a good work. He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. This is the same as what he writes in uh, Hebrews 12. Two, looking unto Jesus, the author, he who hath begun, the author, will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ, the finisher of our faith. This is the points A and B that I talk about very often relating to Romans 8 as the, those he justified them, he also glorified. The point A and the point B, justification, point B, glorification, and what you do in the interim is the straight line in between uh, what will stand through the fire be for reward or what will be for loss, what will be burned in the fire, but, you know, he himself shall be saved because those he justified, them he also glorified. So what you do in that interim period between points A and B does not have any bearing on point A or on point B. It has bearing on reward. However, the author or beginner and the finisher or the performance of the day of Jesus Christ. These are saying the same thing. He who hath begun a good work, a work of faith, because the beginning of the faith is exactly what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, is the good work, the first taste of grace. By grace are you saved through faith. So what would that good work, that first good work be? Faith which is exactly what we're told in 1 Corinthians, is that foundation can no man lay than that is laid, but is Jesus Christ. And upon the foundation is what is built that will stand through the fire and be free reward, or will suffer loss, be burned in the fire. But he himself shall be saved because that original foundation of faith stands. So the beginning good work is the work of faith that is justification. That is the author the beginning, he who hath begun a good work through justification will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ, to the day of glorification. Thus, Hebrews 12 tells us, he who hath begun a good work will be faithful to complete it. The author, finisher, justifier, glorifier. And the first taste of that is uh, the grace of God. Um, 1 Peter 2, 3. 
I just lost it. Anyway, uh, 1 Peter 2, 3 talks about the first taste that we receive of God's grace is our justification as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. Well, how do you get to be a newborn babe? It's the spiritual rebirth. You're, you're born again, uh, which is the beginning of your faith, your justification. So it's just kind of interesting how uh, people say, well, Hebrews isn't for us. Well, yeah, but he tells the same thing to both groups of people, which makes them equally important, which means you need to read the book of Hebrews too. So Philippians 1, 7, or 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work, justified in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, glorified, because those he justified, them he also glorified. Even as it is meet for me to think of this of you all, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels or in the affection of Jesus Christ. So again, this is an edifying letter to them and encouraging its moral support. Don't give up. Don't give up. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment or discernment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. This is part of the, the love. Um, sincere communication, let no uh, insincere communication proceed out of your mouth. It's how you talk to people. Why? Well, because what proceeds out of your mouth is a representation of what's in your heart. And what's in your heart should be good and perfect and lovely. Uh, he tells us to dwell on those things. Um, in one of the verses, whatever is good and pure and lovely dwell on those things. Uh, the insincere communication or the sincere communication rather that's going to come out of your mouth is a representation of, of what your uh, what your heart space is like. So he says um, that's the way that you should be honest, sincere, truthful, approving things that are excellent without offense until the day of Christ. Being fulfilled, or excuse me, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. The fruits of righteousness, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things there is no law. Just learn that in Galatians 5. So these are the things that we be filled with rather than insincere communication, things that uh, cause strife, things that cause division. But I would ye understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul's been in and out of prison. Um, he wrote a bunch of his epistles while he was in prison because, you know, what else is he going to do? No, he's making productive use of his time. So um, this is probably no different that he was uh, in bonds when he, he wrote. But obviously good is going to come of that because he was imprisoned because he was preaching the gospel and people took offense to that. So he's obviously going to use the platform that he's given to do good work and being imprisoned uh, is no less a good work because it was... Uh, People who didn't like hearing him that put him there. Which is what Jesus said, that people would be in prison for preaching. Um, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So they're preaching Christ for selfish ambition, not to add to the faith. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the deference of the gospel, defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached? So people might do it for their own selfish gain. And honestly, I don't even know what situation that would be in, but obviously it happened because he's writing about it. Um, so whether they're preaching for their own selfish gain or whether they're preaching sincerely to help others doesn't really matter because either way, Christ is being preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and to my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, body whether it be by life or by death. So he's imprisoned, and uh, whether 
whether bodily good or bad shall come of it doesn't really matter because to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he's actually saying, I would rather die and be with Christ, but it's more needful for me to be alive so that I can write to you and obviously preach and write to other people. So while I am alive, I shall use the time that I have redeeming the days because they're evil, which is what Jesus and James say. James repeating Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Um, but he says it, it, it would be better for me to die and be with Christ. And, and that's what he actually says in 2 Corinthians 5 is, uh, we are willing rather, and I say, to be absent with the body and present with the Lord. But until such a time as that occurs, we have a job to do. But he's saying if I had a choice, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would let this mortal body pass and uh, be, with, be with Christ in spirit. He says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I, what not, I know not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And, and people might confuse this and say, well, he wanted to be raptured, but that's not true. Because if he was raptured, they would have been raptured too. He wouldn't have had anyone to write to because they would have gone with him. He's talking about through death. And the hope that he's talking about is never the rapture specifically. It's about the hope of resurrection where he's going to be changed to a glorified state. It's never about the rapture. And people get so rapture focused that they're like, oh, Paul wanted to go. He, he wanted to go in the rapture. That's not true. He wanted to depart bodily. The self-focus versus the other focus. And, and I, I hesitate to harp on this too much, so I'm going to just make a small point and then move on. But we become very self-focused by wanting the rapture to happen because I want to go. I want to go. And for whatever reason, we don't want to just escape through death. We want to escape through, through the rapture, through the removal, so that we bypass death. And that is not how Paul thought or what Paul taught. Because the other focused part is that I want to be removed, so I'll go through death. It's more needful for God for, for me to be here to help you. So obviously I'm not going to like wish death upon myself. I'm not going to go seek it. But I wish that I could be removed so that I could be with Christ. But it's more needful for me to remain here for you. Which means that you would not be going at the same time means he's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about departing through death. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That you can't, while you're in the body, you are not with the Lord. But when you're not in the body, you are with the Lord. So he's not talking about the rapture and the resurrection. He's talking about deceased, being deceased. He says, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart through death and to be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So if he was talking about the rapture, he would be talking about the flesh being changed to a glorified body. He wouldn't be departing from his body. When he's talking about departing from his body, he's talking about through death. So he's like, I wouldn't mind if, if God took me home now. If I'm ready to go, that means I'd be with him sooner. But that's not his will for my life. So while I'm here, it's more needful for me to, uh, it's more needful to God's plan for my life to remain so that I can help you along too. But if I had a choice, <laughs> so just to, to keep that a little bit in context, is, is Paul never uh, taught that we should pray for the rapture, nor that we should want to uh, be self-focused and go sooner rather than later so that other people who, uh, if the rapture happened later, would possibly be included. Um, so, so essentially what I'm, what I'm just cautioning people about is to be careful what you pray for because you pray for the rapture to happen now. And if it did, then how many other people would miss out on that opportunity? You can't speed it or slow it. It has a set time. It has an appointed time. So uh, our, our prayer should be that while we're here, that God would make use of us in the best way possible. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. This is the other focused part. Long, uh, demanding or wanting the rapture to happen now, 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 because I don't want to be here is very self-focused. And that is not what Paul ever taught us to be. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy or progress of faith. 
that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me and my coming to you again. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So whether I'm able to come to you or not, I want to hear that you guys are doing good things, that you're making progress, that you're not losing hope, that you're not losing faith, that you're not down in the dumps. I want to hear that you're making a difference in this world. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Don't be afraid. Fear those, fear him who is able to kill the body and the soul. Do not kill those. Don't fear man. This is what Jesus says. He's, don't fear man. Man is able to kill the body only, but fear him who is able to kill the body and the soul. So he says, and nothing be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Because if they did die for their faith, where would they go? Just right to God. <laughs> to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So what fear would you ever need to have of anyone who can kill your body? Because if you're saved, you're going to heaven in spirit to be with Jesus immediately. For unto you is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. So I am going to leave it at that. That is our introduction to the book of Philippians, and I will return going through more chapters in the next video. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, let me know, but have a good night.